current Sufi activity, work, literature, groups and techniques, by Chawan Thelmus. A note by the translator. Out of old fields, as men see, comes all this new corn year by year. And out of old books, in good faith, comes all this new science that men learn. Chaucer, Parliament of Fowls Sufi Procedures, Organization in the World Their Work Enterprises The Sufi approach to professional, vocational and business activities resembles that of other communities, but the similarity serves also to conceal certain dramatic differences. Sufi disciples will cooperate in what seem to be almost every kind of activity, ranging from the arts, through commerce to academic and other undertakings in the world of learning. A number of seekers will associate together to pursue a project, because the successful completion of a mundane activity is often regarded as an index of the necessary harmonization of the group. In other words, if the project works, the members of the group are in the kind of alignment which will enable them to profit from the subtle, spiritual impulses which the Sufi work is offering. This kind of pattern is familiar in all groups with a common interest. Both religious and other groupings, of short or long duration, can be found working together in a wide variety of areas throughout the world. The difference comes when one examines the theory and mechanism of the Sufi and the other groupings. In the case of the Sufis, a project is devised and an attempt is made to carry it out. If this succeeds, that is, if the shop, factory, artistic atelier and so forth flourishes within a reasonable period of time, the group concerned is accepted with its membership as eligible for special exercises and instructions, which are believed to be able to operate through this organism with extraordinary rapidity and effectiveness. The group need not be money orientated. Some groups are charitable others devised for entertainment, still others work in the fields of planning, design, agriculture or even certain spheres of diplomacy. But while there need not be a financial aim in the undertaking, if it is one which ordinarily yields a profit, then the index of its success always includes profit, and the entire yield is always made available to the Sufi path. The Sufi teacher ordinarily authorizes the experiment and may give it the time scale in which it is to succeed. If the project does not progress sufficiently well, the harmonization of its individual members is considered to be at fault, and the effort must be stopped. Many such entities fall into the hands of people who capture them and milk them for their own profit. This is not only regarded as reprehensible, it also has a positive side. The entire group and the operation itself is deemed to have gone sour. The positive advantage has been that the unsuitable members have been identified. Henceforth, the work, as it is called, can insulate itself from this diseased limb. This application of the doctrine that the exterior is an indicator of the interior strikingly emphasizes the belief that harmony brings about coherent, organic growth, and, in contradistinction, that the imposition of patterns upon groups will never succeed in developing anything. From this, it can be seen why so many Sufis are on record as working so vehemently against imposed structure. It also gives a clue as to why Sufis, other than those who imagine that they are Sufis, will never subject everyone from their communities to the same exercises, or even to the same range of ideas. It is, however, true that the Sufi organism as a whole constitutes one single body. But this unity is one which is understood and worked with only by the realized Sufi. The unity is invisible at ground level, as it were.
The vast miscellany of some Sufi master's activities from this viewpoint makes, if not sense, at least a distinction between repetitious and limited activity and the whole complicated structure within which the teacher works. An important and highly respected Sufi teacher in the Middle East, when asked his reactions to what we often think of as truly Sufi groups, with attentive disciples clustered around a teacher who gives out invocations and encourages unusual dress and talks all the time of unity, self-realization or unification with the absolute, instead of carrying out a comprehensive program, said, I constantly see such people, both here and in Europe and America. Everyone thinks that they are Sufis except the Sufis themselves. Whenever I meet these circuses, I go home to have a good laugh. Sufi Use of Literature Technical and instructional literature is well understood in all cultures as a source of information and education. This is no new invention. Some of the oldest materials found in written form from long-dead civilizations are instructional ones, ranging from commercial formulae to descriptions of the correct manner of organizing funerals or religious ceremonies. It has, however, been observed that when written and oral materials have been employed for many generations, they can acquire a ritualistic significance. They begin to be revered for their own sake, for their sound, or for their ancient origins or repute. Among the Sufis, it is somewhat startling, though always refreshing, to note that only in secondary or deteriorated groupings is there any sign of reverence for literature, apart from its instrumental function. As an example, while spurious and imitative groupings, which are common and widespread throughout the East, will repeat litanies, ranging from shouts of Who, He, or Yapir, O Teacher, the use of sounds and ideas in written or spoken form within the legitimate Sufi organizations is confined to the people, the times and the occasions where they are believed to have a specific as we would in current terminology call an intended and technical effect. So striking is this difference between ritualism and function that it may be taken as the dividing line between ignorant quasi-Sufism and the real thing. Ritualistic exclamations and the magical repute of words and phrases are, of course, very widespread in all religious communities. The absence of these in Sufi circles of the authentic type may be taken as an assurance of the way in which these materials are viewed by the Sufi. They are not used for arousing emotions or to try to cause an effect, but kept as a part of what the Sufi would call the science of religion, ilm al-din. In this respect, the genuine Sufi usage both dramatically departs from familiar religious usage and almost uncannily parallels, or perhaps duplicates in its own field, the educational and scientific activities. Controlling oneself and being controlled If the Sufi teacher's ability depends upon his being able to perceive a pattern invisible to others, and to snatch parts of it for employment as ingredients of a teaching system, it is also noted that this teacher himself must have unusual powers of detachment. The most noteworthy of these appears to be that the teacher's behaviour is not occasioned by his needs, thoughts and desires. It is planned and executed according to the needs of the learner. It is therefore often said, for example, that the teacher's anger is better than the praise of any other individual because he is angry in order to help shape you. Others are pleased because of every other reason. Detachment, which is regarded as a high aim of a spiritual nature in other systems, is the lowest accomplishment of the Sufi. Detachment, according to this way of thinking, frees a man or woman to make decisions, to see, to exist. 
But the Sufi system requires that the Sufi is able to detach or not to detach. Other methods ignore this factor. For them, to be unable to be anything other than detached is the height of achievement. To the Sufi, this kind of detachment is not detachment at all, but as it has been called, slavery to detachment. People in this state are neither controlled by themselves nor by anything else. This is the type generally referred to in Western literature as the quietist. Among the Sufis, the type is regarded as a failure. His or her references to the high or humble state of experience being enjoyed are invalid. So detachment becomes a part of cultism instead of a stepping stone in the path of learning. Whether based on reality or not, this contention of the Sufis perhaps deserves close study. Certainly it has not been carefully noted by scholars, and even less by psychologists, who tend to accept or reject the validity of mystics' attitudes only by reference to current psychological doctrine. And this, in turn, is subject to constant changes in fashion. Discouraging Potential Recruits Deflection If the reputed wonders performed by the Sufi masters, and the extraordinary importance attained by them, unparalleled by any mystics in Western experience, attracted swarms of disciples, their policy of deflection certainly served to cause great confusion. Deflection, Kaj Kardan, would nowadays be termed in psychological jargon aversion treatment. People who are on record over the centuries as being most bitterly opposed to Sufis are often found to be those who have applied for discipleship and been refused. The Sufi refusal methods, however, tend to specialize in making things unpalatable for the would-be disciple, so that he is deflected by the action of the Sufi's words or behavior upon the applicant's cherished assumptions. Deflection can take as many forms as the ingenuity of the Sufi's thought. Rabia of Basra infuriated narrow theologians anxious for initiation by saying, I am going to burn the Kaaba, the holiest place in Islam. The clerics denounced her as an apostate. She explained, however, to more discriminating people that the burning of the Kaaba would be necessary if people took it as an idol which some people certainly have done. When recently asked whether it was not bad policy to alienate powerful scholars by deflection methods, a certain illustrious Sufi answered the present writer, No, because these people are generally so nasty that their enmity indicates to thinking people that we are not likely to be as nasty. Remember, only a small-minded person is affected by deflection methods. Modern Sufis deflect the myriad cultists who try to enroll with them by refusing to be vegetarians, to wear Indian scents, to don odd garb, to pronounce on voguish causes, even to denounce all these things. This, as much as anything, has created the stark difference between genuine Sufis and those who pose as such. The latter are always visible because they compromise with what the obsessional cultists already believe. Astrology, numerology, strange beliefs, the formation of communes, random grouping of like-minded people, treks and expeditions, styling oneself by titles now not used by Sufis, Mushid, Qutub, Dada, Maula, Pir, Hakim, are among those said to have been abandoned since they have sometimes been assumed by anyone who felt like it, are very much appreciated by the hangers-on who imagine that they are Sufis and are being taught by Sufis, when both parties are usually self-deceived. Perhaps the most telling form of deflection is when applicants approach a Sufi entity and seek admission as disciples or followers. Since the Sufis, like all other educational bodies, first have to determine the suitability of the candidate, 
They almost always require the novice to undergo a course of study to prepare him or her by first removing misconceptions. This is no more onerous, of course, than expecting a witch doctor who wants to study medicine first to familiarise himself with the principle of science as distinct from magic. But the applicant, almost by definition, wants to be stimulated, not to be informed and helped to develop. We have to be wary of the use of terms here, since someone who wants illumination and sensation will often imagine that he is approaching just that by saying that he wants teaching. Deflection takes place when the expectations of the entrant are disappointed. It is not uncommon for would-be Sufis to say that they have applied to join another path since they receive no answer to their letters, or that they waited eight weeks, or eight or more months, and nothing happened. All that was happening was that the Sufi authority was preparing to supply the necessary teaching programs. Time and again, of course, in the Sufi teaching materials, we find that people miss their chance through not having enough patience. In realistic terms, this simply means that the applicant was not seeking what the Sufis supply. He, or she, wanted excitement. The Sufis are able to supply only the right way to knowledge. The deflection necessity, of course, has caused the greatest possible discomfort and annoyance to those who imagine that they are being held back from secrets or are being treated with disdain, while in reality they are already partly on the path and need very badly the straightening out of their approach to learning. The Idea of Organic Enterprises If activities originated by intending Sufis provide, through their success or failure, an index of the progress of the individual and the entire membership, the work-for-the-work work format offers an example of the structure of the whole church or organism. Work-for-the-work work essentially means taking part in an enterprise laid down and controlled by the Sufi teacher. In its most common form, this involves the establishment of a kanka, monastery, or zavia, place of activity, where all kinds of tasks, ranging from domestic and agricultural ones to special exercises and procedures, may be participated in. The chief difference between this Sufi organisation and those belonging to, say, Christian, Buddhist and other denominations is that the study course is not fixed but manipulated. The number of people attending may be large or small, may fluctuate. There may be no apparent regularity in the activities. The belief is that the community is an organism which is constantly changing. The experiences of the individual human unit in this must change from time to time to produce an all-round development, known as maturing, and a harmonization, known as hamdard, sympathy, literally breathing together. An example of the interrelation of factors in the Sufi system is seen here in the matter of constant and irregular activity. While the irregularity of the activities is held by the Sufis to mirror the rhythm of another spiritual dimension, the unfamiliarity of this behaviour places a strain upon those who seek constant or regular activity, leading many of them to eliminate themselves from the study course. Hence, the learning process itself is employed to sift students and to dissuade those who cannot harmonise with it, without a word being said. The Sufis also make no attempt to explain what has happened, with the result that many disappointed students have always claimed that nothing happens among the Sufis without refutation. When working for a cause, the lay and religious people of other denominations may be said to be already converted, or at least to have faith or belief or admiration, which causes them to be attracted to and involved in the work which is the aim of the community. 
The overall concern of the enterprise may be, as an example, putting Christian charity to work by helping the poor or afflicted, the less well-off. It may take the form of social or psychological action. The case of the Sufi is different. Among the Sufis, it is the teacher alone who knows the pattern of the work and who organizes its shape and cadence. Since its aim is to illuminate the seeker, this illumination cannot exist, so runs the argument, at the point at which the disciple enters the movement. He still has to learn. The Sufi activity, therefore, is more like a school, an educational activity, whose members are mainly there to follow the course which shall give them the ability to fulfill yet further functions. The participation does not provide the emotional interests or immediate rewards or punishments which are implicit in membership of other spiritual bodies. For this reason alone it must be admitted that the long-standing concept that all religious enterprises are ultimately the same cannot be sustained after a close examination of the Sufi way. What, then, attracts the intending Sufi to the school in the first place? Sufis themselves will say that there can be any reason or none. They seldom or never employ the backwards reasoning which holds that the fact that the applicant wishes to join proves that he is attracted to the real. The teacher's role, however, is to maintain a healthy relationship on some basis of cooperation with the student and from there to direct his development along the lines which the school, the individual, and the overall activity make possible. This very conception concentrates a very considerable amount of authority and almost omniscience in the teacher. He has a very broad scope, and the implication is that he has knowledge which is available to few other men or women. When the point was put by the present writer to an important Sufi teacher, the reply was, verbatim, as follows. The importance or authority is more imagined than real when it is rendered in the terms employed by you. Looking at it in this way should enable you to see it as it really is. If a man who has been accustomed to working in a potato field and knows little about intensive and varied cultivation comes across a farmer with wider knowledge and experience, he might well exclaim, Why should you have such power over these matters which I do not know about? Pruning, seedlings, gathering the flowers and not the roots of the crops. Is there nobody to check you, and why do you exercise such a miscellaneous and patternless sway over this area? The apparently chaotic nature of the Sufi activity, continued this informant, could be given in similar terms. The newcomer would wonder why the farmer was at one moment ploughing, and at another covering plants, and at a third cutting them down. He would be, of course, dealing with different crops, as he was concerned with the overall activity as well as the individual plants and specific crops. There is a circumstance in which the disciples may be at some risk if they follow a supposed Sufi teacher who behaves in an eccentric manner. They may attribute his commands or actions to tests or to hidden knowledge or again to his following the path of blame, deliberately incurring odium for spiritual reasons, when in fact, due to the inevitable ravages of nature, his mind may be impaired. Naturally enough, this condition has occurred, and may be expected to occur again, frequently in the past. How do the students know whether their master has taken leave of his senses, is deteriorating mentally? For the brain, after all, is among other things a machine subject to decay and damage. In all areas where Sufi operations are in train, there are always imitators, casualties and Sufi schools. It is the task of the school to make sure that its teaching staff, whether the master or his secondary representatives, the channels, 
are not the sole source of information as to their own condition. Hence, in the West, for instance, the Society for Sufi Studies carries on that task. What is deplorable is that some students become so earnest that they transfer onto the personality of the director without imagining that they should keep in direct contact with the real head of the work through the society in the West and the Muasisa in the East. It is a pity that other religious bodies do not provide similar safeguards. Work for the work has been observed by the present writer organized in the form of a farm, of a business, of a school, and of a department of administration. It is often imitated by those who have heard of it or who have made it a study, but such attempts generally fail for one or more of the following reasons. 1. The teacher yields to pressure to provide activities to satisfy the craving of the students. 2. The activities are chosen from books or through reference to folklore. 3. The recruitment is haphazard. Or 4. The teacher begins to employ the students to serve him, obtain things for him, perhaps including money, and or amuses himself at their expense. The conception of a community of people who, within the seemingly ordinary structure of a business or a house and grounds, can be working also in a harmony which activates something other, something spiritual but not emotional, something purposeful beyond the overt purposes of the enterprise, is startling and has far-reaching implications. Not least of the latter is the fact that the more successful a Sufi school of this kind is, the less likely will it be to resemble what people imagine a Sufi school to be. Instead of ritual, there may be activity of an apparently mundane kind. Instead of unusual garb, there will be specific clothing appertaining to the task on hand. In place of hierarchy, there will be cooperation. The place of chanting, symbols, and various appurtenances will be taken by specifics, which are directly and reasonably to all appearances connected with the surface aim of the community. It has been remarked that this may be the origin of the phrase work is prayer, also employed on a lower level by those who claim that work is in itself good morally, though not in the sense understood by the Sufis that within a certain kind of work, carried on in a certain manner, with specially selected people, resides the means of realizing an inner perception. I have had the opportunity of studying several Sufi entities which operate as social units, including what in the West would be called cultural societies, involved in the study and enjoyment of literature and leisure pursuits. The striking thing about these is that the ordinary human tendency to make a means into an end is strictly excluded and strongly resisted. For example, people who waste the time of the society in discussion and minute involvement in the day-to-day -day running or administrative procedures, often the real mainstays of Western associations, are singled out as being opposed to the real aims of the society. It exists for them to relate to others and to harmonize with the work. If they talk too much, draw attention to themselves too much, bore or annoy other people, no matter how much work they put in for the entity, they are regarded as opposing the conditions which alone make the individual and group understanding, towards which all are working possible. Those readers who belong to societies which harbour compulsive activists and sticklers for the rules may well wish that they were subject to Sufi discipline. It is noteworthy that the best known and therefore most visible forms of Sufi organisation tend to be those which are characterised by rules, outward show and ritualism, anathema to the authentic tradition. It is therefore possible that these forms, long considered to be typical of Sufi bodies, are in fact only visible because they have developed distorted, externally striking characteristics.
Naturally, if a Sufi organization can in fact bear a resemblance to any kind of human enterprise, we are faced with the possibility, even the likelihood, that the ones known to us on the whole are not typical and less than legitimate, while the essential Sufi work continues in forms which, almost by definition, would be invisible to any but the most careful observer. This ability of the Sufis to work within any framework which they find convenient may have given rise to the belief that the Sufis are, or have, a secret society, since people engaged in an activity which on the surface is, say, commercial, but which is in essence spiritual, are likely to be labelled as assuming a disguise. In actual fact, however, Sufi doctrine has it that any human organisation may be useful spiritually as well as productive in other senses and should therefore be used since it fulfills two functions, both of them laudable. It could well be our assumption that, for instance, a literary society can only be used for one purpose merely betrays a relative ignorance of the potentialities of organisation itself. After all, as one Sufi put it when commenting on this proposition, a human being or a piece of wood, and many other things besides, are never regarded as solely for one purpose. Why should a body of people be similarly limited? The conception may be strange, but the logic is not weak. Entry into a Sufic group The classical Sufi group does not closely resemble, in recruitment and operation, the traditional wise man's circle image. In the forms of spiritual instruction familiar to us from the Hindu and Buddhist public projections, there is the picture of the sage, surrounded by his disciples, speaking or not speaking, giving out instructions and exercises, and generally forming the centerpiece of what most closely resembles a family as we know it. First of all, not all Sufis are teachers. The sage may exist in order to exercise functions, and so runs the tradition, which are not perceptible to the public. Secondly, the Sufi master teaches when and as he can, not in a mechanical pattern. Unchanging groups and frequent and repeated exercises, indeed, are taken by Sufis to indicate deteriorated forms which can scarcely be called Sufi at all. This also brings up the question of who is a Sufi. The classical masters are unanimous that, one, a Sufi does not call himself such, though others may so style him, and two, a Sufi is the product of Sufi study and development, and therefore seekers or learners cannot call themselves Sufis, or even be called such, except for convenience of reference. A Sufi group, therefore, is not a group of Sufis, but a group of would-be Sufis. Those who are seeking, and who are not teaching, are called dervishes, the poor. In organisations which have developed into mere social or local groupings, people may be admitted by initiation and take part in all or many of the activities of the group. These, numerous in the East, are regarded by authoritative Sufis as having lost their Sufic content and to be mere power structures. It is important to be able to recognize these, whether they occur in the East or West, since they do not represent the real tradition, but a dilution of it. Since by definition the intending Sufi does not know what it is that he is going to learn, and since he is also by definition unable to contribute to the activities or influence of the Sufis, and since, again by definition, he cannot claim the right to become a Sufi. There is no such thing as an application to join the Sufis. The situation, however, is not as vague as this may seem to imply. The Sufis have, and apparently have had for centuries, organizations and individuals, both in the East and in the West, 
which exist partly for the purpose of attracting people who already feel some kind of harmony with the inner sense of the Sufis. As already noted, these organizations are usually not put forward as spiritual schools at all, but much more often seem to be mundane associations of people. Someone may even be a member of one or more of such bodies for years before realizing that it has an inner spiritual core. In countries where the actual word Sufi is known, and in order to offer an alternative to the cults which claim to be Sufis but which are really not such, there is always someone who represents what is known as the Muasisa, roughly translated as the institution. Quite often, such an individual also has prestige in the host community. He, or she, may be a literary or legal, nowadays a scientific or an administrative figure. There may be several organizations in any one country, all linked to the Muasisa, which together form the complete Sufi school, creating confusion among outside observers, which is one of the objects of this kind of arrangement. It is widely believed among the followers of this path that anyone on a straight path is never lost, Sadi, a classical author of the Sufis, and conversely, that people who become attached to spurious or diluted cults, or remain in them, are at least themselves partly to blame. This has been known to startle people who tend to imagine that it is the disciple who is led astray by the villainous and bogus mystical teacher. This contention that the learner may be at least as much to blame may well be deserving of investigation. Sufis who feel that any individual may be a candidate for study will often contrive to get to know such people and see whether a social as well as a more subtle harmonization is possible. In such cases, the people being approached will not necessarily be introduced to the typical Sufi literature. This, again, is because, as it is claimed, Sufis may teach within any format and the frameworks and literature which are generally considered to be essential to the Sufi are in fact only those which form a single facet of their activities. This contention has been constantly stressed by the classical masters, but oddly enough no single scholar, so far as the present writer is aware, has ever given it any attention whatever. Given that even scholars, including many world-famous experts on Sufism, do not accept the statements of the authorities of the system which they are allegedly studying, there would seem to be a case for a completely fresh approach to Sufi studies, this time taking note of all the Sufi materials and not just those which appear to concur with a pre-existent image of what the Sufi should be, in the minds of those who do not really know and who therefore effectively concoct the Sufi cult from a set of ideas obtained from a highly miscellaneous ragbag of information. The Sufis as a Cult A study of the academic and popular writings on Sufis, both in the flesh and through their literature and the comments of others, clearly shows that there is a vast shortfall in accurate information. Writers tend to copy one another to such an extent that almost the entire chapter on Sufis and Sufism in an otherwise respectable book may be lifted from an unverified source. Borderline cults, which may have been started and operated by charlatans and ignoramuses, are treated with the same credence as typically Sufic entities, which are clearly more authentic. Scholars, no less than propagandists, can be seen again and again to edit and to excise important information which does not fit into their version of what the Sufis are and what they do and believe. In short, the situation as regards Sufi studies is so chaotic that most of the materials, aside from the works of the classical masters, cannot be relied upon at all. Given this situation, it is scarcely surprising that spurious cults constantly spring up and blot out the legitimate, providing still more information about Sufism 
which is not worth the paper on which it is written. Much of the blame for this state of affairs must squarely be laid at the door of the scholars throughout the world who have lacked the means to verify their materials but have yet not shrunk from compiling vast tomes, rushing into print with articles, and generally muddying the waters when their task should have been one of clarification before anything else. Sufis, for example, have been characterized as people who induce frenzy, who carry out religious dancing, who make public displays of music, who affect strange garb, to collect almost at random such evidences of supposedly standard and important practices is tantamount to assessing anything by means of secondary and unreliable criteria. But scholars and travellers are no less human in being affected by externals and the dramatic. The only fault herein is that they do not emphasise this. Christianity, too, could be described by exactly the same practices as have been regarded as standard ones of the Sufis. Let us list them. The induction of frenzy is found in the snake handling and other revivalist cults in America and elsewhere. But this behaviour, clearly deviant, is not taken as evidence of membership in Christianity. Resuming our list, we find religious dancing in Christian churches in Lebanon public displays of music among others with the Salvation Army, and strange garb everywhere in Christendom. Add all these up. Does this make a picture of our basic faith of Christianity, or does it mean that the Sufis are in fact Christians? The reality is, of course, as almost any sociologist should be able to conclude, that none of these local and limited manifestations has anything much to do with the religion which is supposedly represented therein. So, lamentably, the state of understanding of the Sufis both in the East and in the West resembles a superficial and arbitrary evaluation such as we might find if, say, railways were to be described by their chief features by someone, or some people, who said that they were things which caused death which were traversed by vehicles painted green or red, which made consignments of fish deteriorate because they were left too long in sidings, and so on. The conclusion, based on the classics and contact with a very different type of Sufi from the one dear to the cultists and commentators, is that the Sufis are not a cult, but there is no lack of people who wish to make them such. The Western literature, regarded as standard reference and descriptive works covering supposedly Sufi activities, almost never deal with legitimate groups. Their very size and the apparent authority wielded by such assemblages of people seem to have confused the writers into imagining that they are in the main line of the tradition. Among the writers who have been taken in in this way are Sir Richard Burton, in his work about the Sindh cultists, Berger in his Bektashi Order of the Dervishes, which is a survey of a series of contaminated cults, Brown in the Dervishes, a hodgepodge of information and confusion, again relying upon secondary manifestations, and several others, some of whom have attained a certain status by means of these largely worthless books. Works by Fatemi, Shah and Shushtari also exist, these being the reliable materials which deserve close attention. A cult may be termed a belief system with fixed observances, which practices indoctrination. Approved cults in any society tend to be the official belief systems, the national cult, patriotism given a framework of beliefs and practices, and any other set of beliefs which either supports the local consensus or at the last does not militate against it. Scientifically speaking, therefore, it is impossible to distinguish between the Boy Scout movement, as an example, and any other religious or nationalistic training system, even though the adherents and sympathizers of such systems would insist, in all probability, that their own organization bore no resemblance to others. 
The Sufis, on the other hand, in their classics and in the work of their genuine present-day exponents, work against the formation of cults and also provide a means to distinguish the cult from the educational organization. For this reason, it is impossible to label the Sufis as members of any cult whatever unless one chooses so to style the entirely unrepresentative bodies which, for instance, teach a single system and maintain a single set of practices applicable upon all or most of the participants. The Sufis claim, therefore, to be scientific and also to be non-cult and anti-cult must be accepted by all reasonable people as verifiable in terms of the most modern methods of assessment. What has prevented the understanding of this is the fact that, at the time of writing, even advanced sociologists have often failed to absorb the information of what a cult is, and to accept as cults those bodies of thought and action which surround them. Until this understanding is diffused among the scholarly and professional community of sociology and its kindred disciplines, it will not be open to sociological and psychological thinkers to discern the real effect and contribution of the Sufis, dating from over a thousand years ago, to their very modern science. It can hardly be surprising that the members of the sociological professions find it hard, sometimes even impossible, to believe that their métier has already been pioneered by people of whom they have never heard, because their work is in the literature of the Middle East centuries ago. Sufism is clearly to be seen, if we examine its documents and deal with its legitimate proponents of today, to be both a means of understanding spiritual paths, as well as a series of systems which have paths or methods of their own. Herein lies the key to the confusion among three kinds of people in respect to the Sufis. The three kinds are the Orientalists, the Sociologists, and the Cultists. The Orientalists, accustomed to dealing with the very large number of degenerate forms of Sufis, which are in fact nothing more or less than cults, imagine that all Sufism must be composed of cults. In so thinking, of course, they are undoubtedly guilty of selective study and one-sided thinking, as they fail to read the classics on this matter. The second group, the sociologists, have come to think of all human development groups as cults, and therefore hardly expect that advanced thinking on this topic existed centuries before modern sociology. The third section, the cultists, are looking for cults, like the other two categories, but in order to join, not to study them, and therefore seize upon whatever they can in Sufism which seems to them to have cultism attitudes. They find plenty because of the proliferation of deteriorated forms already referred to. The contemporary notion that the Sufis are in fact carrying on a scientific enterprise, pioneered in recent years by their spokesman Idris Shah, is slowly but steadily percolating into the literature and should eventually find complete recognition. As with other discoveries, there is a tendency for the professionals to avoid admitting that they have failed to observe, in identical materials, something which someone else has illustrated. For this reason, it is noticeable that it is the younger sociologists and others who have found it possible to look at the materials objectively. Their personal self-esteem is not bound up with the traditional way of looking at things enshrined, irretrievably, in the writings of their elders. Religion, Evolution and Intervention The great religious organisations, with their churches and temples, priesthoods and liturgies, with their sacred documents and their regalia, rituals and monasteries, these are perhaps the most familiar form of spirituality to a majority of the world's peoples. They are, indeed, to almost everyone, religion itself. What they teach is regarded as literally true by most believers, 
Their priesthoods, or the equivalent, even in systems which deny having such, command almost supernaturalist respect. A study of the writings and words of the Sufis, however, reveals that this attitude is far from being that of the nominally Muslim, Christian or Jewish thinkers who have had their say in this area. Religious externals, according to them, and these externals include both outward acts and emotional sensations, are secondary. Primary is the experiential source of both revelation and also the verification of spiritual truth. Early and contemptuously, the massive organizations derided such attitudes as Gnostic, originally a word for those who know ultimate truth by direct perception. Since Gnostic was turned into a sneer, anything connected with it became bad by association of ideas and by implication. The fact that some Gnostic sects and communities from time to time deteriorated into magico-mystical cults did not improve their image. But the same thing has happened with the fragmentation of beliefs and the production of bizarre sects in all religions without the said faiths being regarded as totally bad. So the religious externals are secondary. That they are subject to a process of superficialization and dilution is evident from many beliefs and practices which are today found in all the major religions and which in fact as certain purists are not slow to point out, sometimes even conflict with earlier sanctions. Historical and archaeological research has, indeed, borne out many of the long-standing contentions of the Sufis in this respect. But if the Sufis have been right in anticipating modern researchers in emphasizing that cherished ideas of today are often of relatively recent development in world faiths, this does not mean to say that the Sufis accord with the scholars who imagine that all religion is simply an elaboration of primitive totem and taboo thinking and practice, developed over the centuries as societies become more and more sophisticated. The Sufis have altogether a far more intriguing and no less plausible idea. They assert, with, for instance, Rumi, that man is evolving and that his religious ideas start with worship of sticks and stones and then develop into something higher. They also aver that, at a certain stage, these primitive faiths evolve into a stage where they can receive the intervention of a higher impulse, the truly divine of which the primitive faith was the ground or precursor, following which the belief system develops into a knowing Gnostic one, which is able so long as its system and teaching remains intact, to refresh itself from the single source of all truth. And the next phase, the primitive may develop into the Gnostic, following which it may well deteriorate again into the hidebound fossil form which is found in most societies, or it may remain true to its correct form. When temporal power, that of the state or of religious leaders, who are in fact disguised power seekers, becomes supreme, as often occurs in most communities, this inward religion, the Gnostic one, has to go underground and may remain for centuries as a parallel stream, waiting to come to the surface again. The initiatory current itself, under such unfavorable circumstances, may also degenerate, giving rise to secret societies or weird sects. This is caused by the loss of the teaching succession. Due to the natural wastage caused by death, the succession of teachers may be interrupted and others take over the system. When this happens, the organization ordinarily shrivels and becomes a kind of deposit, a compost, which may nurture the next legitimate intervention from the source of truth, sometimes called in the Middle East, Orn al-Haq, Lair of Truth. The massive institutional religion, according to the Sufis, also undergoes experiences which produce, first, the fossil stage, where people have to be conditioned to belief since it can no longer supply the inner experience which is now locked within its teaching or sacraments. 
After this comes the period of disillusionment, which in turn leads to the post-liturgical stage, when the stream of truth can again intervene, starting the cycle once more.